Badahov. Badahov, yes, Badahov. Big, nasty, bad Badahov. Uh, <laughs> welcome back to the channel. We're doing Forlorn Hope, the song Badahov. Badahov is a is a, basically a fortress town in, in Spain. It is the one after Ciudad Rodrigo that the British attempt to take. Uh, the British had actually tried to, to besiege Badahov once before. Uh, then we see the Battle of Albuera, which we've talked about before in this channel. Uh, the Battle of Albuera basically is... <laughs> bang, oh, we can't help relieve the Siege of Badahov, and they pull back. This is the second attempt. So, Badahov is nasty. Uh, those of you who have seen Sharp know about Badahov. It's the one with the massive assault, where Sharp's trying to become the uh, the head of the Forlorn Hope, which he technically isn't. But in that show, he doesn't actually become the head of the Forlorn Hope. Even in the books, he doesn't. So I'm not sure why he gets the rewards of it, but anyway, that's wildly off topic. Badahov is basically a, a fortress town. Uh, well defended, it's mined, it has like a, a glasses wall, so it goes down, up, another wall, and then the thing itself, very hard to take. Who is killed here? Is it Abercrombie who was killed? I think it's Abercrombie who was killed at Badahog. Uh, Picton is wounded, and um, Lord Somerset is also wounded, who becomes uh, the leader of the Crimea, his British leader in the Crimea. So, yes. Yeah. I know Picton's in a nightcap at Badahov, but um, as far as we know, he wore a uniform everywhere else, but I've, I've read things about him being in a nightcap at Badahov. I'm not sure why. It's a night assault, but uh, I'm not sure why he'd be in a nightcap. Almost a minute intro. We'll talk about the aftermath of Badahoff later. It's uh, prepare yourself. It's not nice. After 20 nights, the guns lie still, the calm before the storm. So yes, British pounding a, a, a position for about, about three weeks. Yeah, about 20 nights, about three weeks. Pounding a position, and then the engineers have crept forward to make sure it's, it's viable. Um, uh, oh, they're so about engineers. Engineers are like the artillery where you can't purchase commissions. You have to actually get there on merit. And all that means... Well, people say merit. It wasn't merit. It was just time. So if you were really, really good, you could probably jump ahead of the guys in front of you. But nine times out of ten, you were just waiting for your number to be called. It was like Dave on the 21st, and then John enlisted on the 23rd. Dave's getting every promotion unless John does something really spectacular. So, yeah, it was based on basically time served, unless you something really impressive. Um, so yeah, you had these, it, the, the artillery was a little bit more prestigious, but the engineers was really not a prestigious thing to go into. They were getting killed badly, um, especially around 1810 near the Torre Verdres when they started to build that, maybe 1809. But yes, yeah, so the engineer corps had been depleted. So a lot of infantry officers got themselves cross-trained as engineers, and they would be the, the uh, guides. So you'd lead the, the different parties out with the, the engineers would lead you through the siege tunnel, uh, through the siege trenches. So maybe you've got trench works. They lead them through the trenches to the jump off point. And so a lot of these guys were getting killed. A lot of them were just, yeah, just getting killed by the French. Uh, and the reason you want your guns to be silent before you go in is you don't want drop shots or, or, or low balls hitting, literal, literal low balls in this case, uh, hitting your own men as they're gathering up. Uh, obviously, just before you go straight in, you'll, you'll bombard the absolute crap out of it. But uh, for right now, it's sort of there's some kind of animal over there fighting. Uh, for the for, yeah any, anyway we'll, we'll go on with the thing. Um, the waiting men prepare themselves for the carnage yet to come. The carnage is right. Three months since in blood and fire, Ciudad Rodrigo fell. I say Ciudad Rodrigo, Ciudad Rodrigo. I don't know Spanish. But uh, Ciudad Rodrigo was a blood well not really a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath for the civilians. Um, the the British basically followed the old, the age-old military rules, which were, if you surrender, you get to keep your possessions, we won't loot too much. Uh, if we have to fight for it, we're taking whatever we want. Uh, unfortunately, the, the issue is in Spain, the towns aren't, fr aren't French. <laughs> the towns are not French. The towns belong to the Spanish, who are the British allies. So they're not stealing from the French, they're stealing from the Spanish, which drives Wellington nuts. 
uh, which is very easy to say when you have a nice big fat fortune to go home to, <laughs> as opposed to just being some soldier who's basically going to earn his pension by stealing. So, I'm not sure why they did the raping. That's probably just more, more just bestial, you know, just human desires. But the, the money is, is, at least you can understand the money. Um, so yeah, Ciudad Rodrigo was a bloodbath uh, afterwards, as in it was just a looting fest. And uh, Napoleon, uh, sorry, Wellington basically said, I'll hang any man in Badajoz after three days three days of this crap he um he never hung anybody but uh they did erect gallows but yes it was um Badahov itself gets pretty nasty and uh, Ciudad Rodrigo and Badahov are sort of the two sieges that um that sort of scare Wellington um about what he's created it scares him about this force that he's put together of of guys who are very disciplined soldiers probably the best soldiers in the entire world who turn into instant drunken rapists the second the gun smoke disappears very scary force yeah it's on the border of, of um, Spain and Portugal so the, the, the ditch is deep it was it was a big glasses ditch and the French would actually throw burning hay into the ditch sort of like a primitive lum like a primitive illumination flare so as the British are trying to get up they're illuminated by the French who are reaching leaning over and firing pot shots, so you have British counter-fire from muskets and artillery in the dark. Um, there's a little castle outside of Badajoz that uh, Picton's 3rd Division is, is storming. 3rd Division in Peninsula, 5th Division at Waterloo. So Picton's 3rd Division storms this castle, um, and then Picton himself leads them on to the fortress. Uh, but the, the attack fails. The attack on Badajoz fails, uh, and in Sharp, Sharp's the one who rallies them all and goes forward. Uh, in reality, it was Picton and Lord Somerset who basically see, a, see an opportunity and storm from the castle into Badajoz. Soult is, is sort of the main enemy in Spain at this point. He's sort of overall commander. He's coming with a relief force. I should have mentioned that, sorry. Soult is coming with a relief force, uh, which is why Wellington has to escalate this siege. Uh, escalation is when you, when you do the actual siege. Uh, the actual process of besieging somebody is called um, invel not invel investment. So you invest something in a siege, then you escalate the siege into a uh, into a, a what we call a, an attack sort of thing, uh, as opposed to just starving them out. Attack and damn the cost. Yeah. The orders travel down the line. The devil laughs at battle. That's sort of the intro, this is where it really kicks off. The drummer is amazing. I don't know where they got him from, but he's fantastic. Or her, I think it might be a woman. I'm not sure. The forlorn hopes wiped out. Yeah, they're wiped out. The, the French have, um, um, Cheval de Frise, Cheval de Frise, basically, it means Frisian horses, which doesn't make sense at all. Basically, it's, these, it's logs filled with either big spikes or swords. Um, I've heard both. I've heard both, and I believe both. So they would just roll these down, or they would have them set up after you come in. So after you come over the bridge, you've got to get past these Cheval de Frise, normally anti-cavalry, but they work just as well as barbed wire. Think of them as, as barbed wire. Uh, in fact, you'll see barbed wire often set up in the same sort of like triangular portable frames um, these things are normally field combat against cavalry you roll these out on your flanks or protecting artillery pieces but yeah they had uh, they had literal swords <laughs> in big tree trunks that were there and so you jump over and you're like oh crap I'm gonna get over this as that guy's shooting at me and this guy's got a bayonet and these other four people are all coming at me and then there's dead bodies you gotta step over battle is not an easy thing to do at all Yeah. yeah, someone dies and then rubble collapses on them, you just grab their foot and pull yourself up. That's that's what it was. It was brutal. It was very brutal. Much more brutal than anything else in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, well, not, I shouldn't say that. Much more brutal than any normal action in the Napoleonic Wars. Much more brutal than any normal siege. Um, Battlehold was, was extreme. Um, it was much it was much different. You weren't expected to literally climb over dead bodies one after the other after the other and then fight like 
push aside giant sword trunk things as people are throwing grenades down on you. Actual grenades in black powder filled sacks or, or little ceramic things. The, the French actually had those. Um, as cannons are firing down on you, remember grape shot's a thing. You've got a mine as in just like explosives packed under the breach, which is why you had to rush these things, by the way. If you created a workable breach, the enemy knew it too. So the enemy would just fortify that breach. They would mine it. They would set all sorts of traps near it. Uh, if, just ro- if you're climbing up a breach and somebody just rolls a bunch of rocks down on you, that's that's going to kill heaps of people. It's going to kill dozens of people. So um, you really had to rush these things. Yeah, reef on swim again. They had to do it over and over. Yeah, a lot of good men lost a battle hold. Um, Abercrombie, one of the guys who started the line infantry, still got that battle hold. I believe, I believe, he, I saw my certain he was. Picked in. Picton is how. <laughs> Picton is how. So the, the the outlier castle, Picton's third division had taken it, had fought brutally and taken it. And then um, when Picton had, had asked to find out what's going on, because remember it's, it's night, Picton finds out what's going on. He's like, "Oh, we're not getting through the bridge." He's basically like, "Oh, you're not getting through the bridge, but their defenses are weaker here. Let's just attack them here." Uh, the castle was sort of connected, but not. You can't march a division across like a, a six foot wide gap. So he basically just storms this part of the, of the fortress as well. Uh, he himself gets wounded, and uh, he he still fights on from on top of the battlements, wounded, directing his division. And they put a red jacket on the pole and put it up in the air. Yeah, so the Pickens division gets in, red jacket on a pole up. That doesn't mean you have the city. This isn't this isn't a video game where you took the objective and now you win. The guys are still assaulting the breach, and then Picton's guys have got to come up behind them and drive them out. Hence the looting and raping that came after this. If you went through that, you'd probably feel entitled to a bit of compensation. Uh, Not that I'd condone any of that. Uh, Maybe a little bit of looting I would condone. uh, Certainly not anything else. Certainly not trying to murder Captain Sharp's wife. Uh, I wouldn't do that either. You can do that. Yep. Yeah, remember, yeah, literally raped and robbed, but remember, a few soldiers would get yeah, hopped up on gin before they would do these sort of things. Um, you had, a, you had a spirit ration or a beer ration. Most soldiers would take spirits. Uh, you had a spirit ration. And uh, if you were going to do a thing like this, they would probably give you a double or maybe even a triple spirit ration and get you all hopped up on rum or gin or some sort of who knows what. I didn't think they had diesel back then, but they probably would have given you that if they had it. They would get these guys pretty drunk. Uh, and then, I don't know, maybe <laughs> you obviously you're going to break in and find beer, find booze. And so, yeah, guys are a bit tipsy, a bit drunk. They're hopped up on adrenaline, like you wouldn't believe on adrenaline. Uh, Napoleonic combat would produce a sort of a sort of fear and adrenaline that I don't think we can experience today. Uh, modern firefights are sort of... I don't think they could produce the amount of adrenaline you are going through back then. Um, modern firefights, you have very trained soldiers who are working in a very uh, close-knit team. Uh, a Napoleonic siege is something that... that um, I don't think I don't think that there's a worse time to be doing sieges than the Napoleonic era. I don't think there is. Uh, the only time I think it is worse probably be World War One, um, when you're starting to have bolt action rifles. Any any time we have repeating rifles, but face to face with a bayonet, that's your primary weapon in a siege, and you've got one shot, so you don't really want to waste it. Or maybe you panic and you do waste it. And now you go, oh crap, I got no bullets. I'm going to find a safe place to reload. There is no safe place. That guy just got killed. Who is that guy? He's wearing a different uniform to me. Ah, what am I going to do? Like the the hyped up adrenaline. And then you 
you, I, I just got to get out of here. So you bust through and you maybe find a little alley and you're like, I'm, I'm out, I'm done. Uh, my job is to secure the town. So I'm going to secure the town by finding a building and just taking as much stuff as you can. You would be so hyped up on adrenaline. Um, much worse than medieval times. I think in medieval times would be much more of a, you're used to fighting in melee. Um, even in the early period, you're used to fighting in melee. Melee is an expected part of it, but um, the Polyonic period, I think, is probably one of the worst times to, to be in a close combat siege type context. The Portuguese did it too. <laughs> Not just the British. The British are much worse, obviously. But, uh, the Portuguese at least hated the French, uh, hated the, the Spanish, um, so they had an excuse. Although the British hate the Spanish. British also hate the Spanish, by the way. I should put that the, the British aren't friends with the Spanish. Um, their navies had fought each other for years. Um, Trafalgar was a was a Franco-Spanish fleet versus the British. Um, they were enemies. They're only friends now because uh, His Most Catholic Majesty Ferdinand the Seventh got uh, thrown out because Napoleon lies all the time. Napoleon's always going to betray you. He's always going to lie. He's a piece of trash. He's going to lie to you. Uh, if somebody says. Oh, that's cool. I'll take over all your forts and run them for you, and you just you you can focus completely on the campaign. They're lying to you, and they're going to take everything, uh, which which Napoleon did, put his brother Joseph on the throne. Uh, so yes, so the yeah, okay, I get you. There's animosity there. The whole Spanish Armada thing. Um, Spain was present in the Netherlands for a long time, uh, but but again, at this point, the, the the British have been allies with the Spanish for a long time. These British are not animosity with the Spanish. Much The Portuguese would have been much more. Because, uh, the reason the Spanish allied with the French was to take Portugal. So the Portuguese had no love for the, the Spanish really. Portuguese are much better soldiers than the Spanish people. Fight me in the comments. I'll stand by that. And then we have Badehov. Um, but a race against time. A very rushed siege that they really had no choice with. Uh, if the British don't get through here, you're looking at a long, long, drawn-out peninsula campaign. Um, you don't have Badajov, you don't have Salamanca. It, it's such a, such an important thing to win. Uh, and they do it at a very high cost. And unfortunately, the cost is not all in men. Uh, a lot of it was in just discipline. Discipline broke down. The provosts had to be, had to be ramped up. Provosts were like these... I wouldn't say they're MPs because they weren't really MPs. They were sort of provost. Uh, are they kind of like MPs? But they're very informal force that was put together. Some horse guards, officers, just guys. Um, they were, yeah. I guess MPs is sort of the best way to describe it. But um, provost was so much more than an MP. I should, I should do a lot of research and get into really get into what a provost exactly what a provost is, um, because they're very they're very important, but they're very sort of loose. It's hard to nail down exactly what their, it, it, you know, perfect perfect order is exactly what they were doing. So yes, um, Badahov is a victory for the for the Allies, but a a uh, loss for the civilians of Badahov and um, by extension, Cidad Rodrigo. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you'd like to see more Forlorn Hope, go and check out their. They've got a YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to check out more Forlorn Hope commentary. Check on my channel, I've got a playlist, or head over to the Forlorn Hope uh, channel, head over to their website, buy their, buy their music, it's fantastic. Uh, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, I'm just commenting because I really like their music and I think it's a great opportunity to, to learn something. So thank you very much for watching, have a wonderful day.